Welcome to the Kansas City Sports History Podcast. My name is Matt Starr, and I'm your host today. Today, our guest is Willie Akins, who played with the Kansas City Royals from 1980 to 1983. Well, Willie, tell us about where you grew up, what high school, and what athletic experiences you did while you grew up. I grew up in a small town in South Carolina, Seneca, S-E-N-E-C-A. Um, I started to play sports when I was young. I mean, baseball, Little League, Pony League, American Legion, all the way to college before I became a, a professional athlete. Uh, from, from ever since I can remember it, I, I played football, basketball too. All, the, all three of the m- m- major sports in, uh, um, in school. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually, I got a, a scholarship on uh, football to go to college and since baseball was my my favorite sport, you know, I asked the, the coaches if if I could play uh, baseball too, and they, and they said okay. So you got to South Carolina University on a football scholarship. Tell us about your athletic experiences in college. Well, uh, I only played uh, one year in college. Okay. Uh, after my my f- freshman year at South Carolina State College, uh, the schools in the MEAC was in- implementing programs for uh, female the Title Nine at the time. Mm-hmm. And some of the college colleges couldn't afford to add programs for the female and, and keep all of the, um, the other programs. So they got together and divided on, uh, on decided on a uh, sport to drop. So they, they voted on um, baseball. Okay. Uh, during my freshman year, my team was playing against Morgan State up in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. I think the game I had two home runs. After the game, a little short, the fat guy walked up to me introduced himself, walked to Yowls, and he said, Willie, I run an a amateur team up here during the summer. And he invited me up there, and he started naming some of the professional players that had played for that team. Mm-hmm. Uh, Reggie Jackson, Runs, Sroboda. And he said, if you come, uh, I'll find you a job. You can work during the day, and we, we play our games uh, at nighttime. And I had a 1961 Chevy at the time, and I drove from South Carolina to Baltimore, 13 hours. And he found me a job working as a, a laborer at Newlands Construction Company. He found me a place to live with this uh, school teacher. She rented me a room, and while I'm, I was up there playing, the college I was going going to dropped the, the baseball team. So I went to Walter for uh, advice, uh-huh. just to see what he thought I should do. Cause I was planning on going back and probably transferring to a, a college that had a baseball. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Who were your sports heroes when you were a kid growing up? Well, of course, Mays was McCovey. The Giants was was one of my f- favorite teams at the time. Reggie Jackson. Uh, I used to watch Reggie when he hit home runs and you know drop his bat uh-huh. and kind of stand there and look at him. So. Later on in my, my baseball career, I started doing the same thing. And how I became a professional baseball player was Walter told me to go back to my college and talk to my, my football coaches and ask them if I could go to college the first semester of my sophomore year and don't play football. And back then they had a draft in January and June. He said, I'm pr- pretty sure you're going to be drafted by a major league team. So I did that. My uh, coaches said they said okay, and after the first semester of my sophomore year, I dropped out. And January fifth, I'm at home watching TV, and the baseball draft come on, and San Diego Padres had the first pick, and they picked my teammate, Gene Richards, okay. and the California Angels had the second pick, and they picked me. Okay. And I'm like, how did the Angels get me? <laughs> because Walter, he was a scout for the Orioles. Uh-huh. So about 50 minutes later, I guess, uh, Walter called me up and he said, Willie, I got you. I said, Walter, I thought you was a scout for the Orioles. He said, I quit the Orioles about two weeks ago and went to the Angels. Oh, okay. He said, I'll, I'll be down in a, a couple of days uh-huh. t- t- to sign you. So that's that's how my uh, professional baseball career started. Yeah, so on ninth, 1975, you're drafted by the Angels in the first round. You're right, a second pick overall in the draft. Uh so tell us about that experience a little more about getting drafted in your first year of Major League Baseball. How exciting was that? Well, uh, after my first year in baseball, I found out that I, I almost got released by the Angels. Huh. Uh, I was a fo- football player in college. Okay. 
and I weighed about 260. And the angels wanted me to come to spring training at 220 pounds. Ooh, okay. And I reported at 252 pounds. All right. 30 pounds, 32 pounds overweight. Uh -huh. So they assigned a coach to me, Moose Stubbins. And he says he set up a program, a diet program too. And I used to be the, the first one at the ballpark. Used to be the last one to leave. Make a long story short, at the end of spring training, I weighed 200 and and 19 pounds. All right. Well, you did it. Yeah. And I like to share the story with the young players that I coach. And I tell them that, you know, baseball is a game of habits. And one habit I developed my first year in baseball was a work habit because I had to lose that weight in order to be a productive baseball player. And it was something that I kept with me my whole baseball career. The jogging part, you know, become mentally conscious about my weight, mm -hmm. never allow myself to get uh, higher than 220 pounds. Well, then on May 17th, 1977, at the age of 22, you broke into the big leagues of the Angels. Is there anything else for the Angels, uh, history-wise, that you started? Well, you know, that, that was a, a happy time for me, and it was a, a disappointing time for me when they called me up to the big leagues. I had only played in single A and double A. Okay. And I played in triple A, uh, what, May? Uh, a month and a half. Mm -hmm. And they called me up to the big leagues. <laughs> and back then when they called up young players a lot of times, they wouldn't play them. They would put them on the bench and park down them and pinch hit and, <laughs> and stuff like that. And they put me on the bench. And I wasn't getting uh, a chance to play. So I was in the big leagues for like two months, and they, they finally told me, they said, Willie, we can't have you up here uh, sitting on the bench. You need to go back and play. Mm -hmm. And I was upset, disappointed that they were shipping me back to the uh, minor leagues, but mm -hmm. I just made up, made up my mind that I was going to go back down and, and do the, the best job that I could. And I finished the year hitting 336. Next year, 78, I played in, in AAA the whole year, and uh I tore up the league. I hit 326, 29 home runs, and drove in over uh, 100 runs. And uh -huh. then 1979, uh, out of spring training, I made the team. Yeah. So, yeah, so on December 6, 1979, you were traded by the Angels, along with Rance Mullinet, uh, for a player to be named Al Cowens and Todd Cruz. Uh, the Royals sent uh, Craig Eaton to the Angels later to complete the trade. Tell us about how you got selected by the Kansas City Royals and who was instrumental in getting you with the Royals. Well, what happened in 1979 when uh, the season started, they had, the Angels had just signed Rob Carew, seven-time American League batting champ from the, the Minnesota Twins, mm -hmm. to play first base. Oh. And it was the, it was the same position yeah. that I played. And I didn't understand that. So when the season started in 1979, I was sitting on the bench again. Mm -hmm. I wasn't playing. And about a month in, into the season, uh, it was a ground ball hit the third base, or... Uh, Bad throw to first. Rod had to come off the bag and tag the runner. And after the play, he came in and, and sat down beside me. And he said, Willie, I think I, I hurt my uh, hand. So the next day when he comes to the ballpark, he has a, he has a cast uh. on his hand. Fergosi, who was the manager at the time, Jim Fergosi, called me inside of his office. And he said, Willie, you are my first baseman now. Uh -huh. So from that day uh, up until when Rod came back, which was a couple of months, I did well. I mean, I just, I, I hit. Mm -hmm. So when Rod came back, they put Rod at first. They put Don Baylor in the outfield who had a, a bad shoulder. He couldn't throw. And I became the, the designated hitter. Okay. But during this, the season in 1979, it seemed like every time we played the Kansas City Royals, I used to hit, I used to hit those guys well. Uh -huh. Leonard, uh, uh, all those guys. Mm -hmm. So I think during that, that that the course of the season, uh, I guess the well, the Kansas City Royals was looking for a first baseman because they had got got rid of of Mayberry, mm -hmm. and I think they had Pete Lacott. Mm -hmm. He was playing first base, so I guess they were thinking to complete their team. They needed somebody to play first base, and I had twenty one home runs, and drove in eighty something runs and three hundred and seventy nine at bats, and I was trade bait for the Angels, mainly because they didn't have a, a position for me. Mm -hmm. Bailey was going to be the designated hitter, and Rod, he was going to play first base. 
So I was traded for uh, Al Collins, Todd Cruz, myself, Rance, Rance, Rance Mullins, and myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after I got traded, John Sherhos, the general manager for the Kansas City Royals, right. called me up and said, Willie, you are our, our first first baseman now. And I was a little surprised I got traded during, during that offseason because I had, had just had knee surgery uh, September 18th. We was here in Kansas City playing against the Royals. Mm -hmm. And I hit a double down on the right field line and slid in to second base and tore up my knee. Mm -hmm. okay. So I had major knee surgery. And the Royals still in, ended up trading for me. Yeah. And the first half of 1980 when I came over here, I struggled. I mean, uh, I struggled really, really bad. And the fans of Kansas City, they, uh, they booed me. Mm. But I, I give credit to my manager, Jim Fry. You know, he stuck with me. He kept playing me. And during the second half of the season, I was able to come back and drive in, drive in almost a uh, 100 runs. Well, the Royals swept the New York Yankees three games to none in the American League Championship Series in 1980. You batted 364 in that series against the Yankees. And you drove in the winning run in the last game of the playoffs against Ron Guidry. That was an incredible time the Royals to sweep the Yankees. Tell us about that experience. Well, before I got here, they had uh, lost to the Yankees, I think, in 76, 77, and 78. Mm -hmm. 79, my team, the Kansas City Royals, won the division. I mean, uh, the California Angels uh -huh. won the division over the Royals by about two or three games. But the Royals, they just seemed like they couldn't beat the, the Yankees for whatever it was uh -huh. in the playoffs. And then finally, I, I got traded over here. And we, we ended up uh, sweeping those guys. Yeah. And, you know, before that uh, playoff started, it was talking uh, the newspaper about was I going to play because the Yankees threw three left-handers. They threw Tommy Johns, Rudy May, and Ron Guidridge. Mm -hmm. And I had a terrible average <laughs> against left-handers for my whole career. I, thought, I think I hit about 220. So the reporter started asking Jim Fry. If they was going to play me, if he was going to play me all three games in, in the playoffs, uh -huh. and Jim Fry came back and said, how can I not play a guy who drove in 98 runs during the, the course of the season? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people always ask me, uh, who was the toughest pitcher I ever faced? Uh -huh. And it's Gidridge. Right, okay. Gidridge had a slider that looked like a fastball. And I couldn't stop swinging the pitches out of, out of the strike zone on this guy. But finally, in 1980, I hit that two-run single against him. Uh -huh. They drove in the, yeah. <laughs> the run, and yeah, great times. That was that was something. And you know, it was the playoffs was just a, a carryover from the the second half of the baseball season when I, I finished up strong, okay. and then I played well against the Yankees, and then we go to to the World Series, and I had an outstanding World Series. I was oh yeah, I was still hot. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very hot time. Okay, yeah. Yeah, incredible postseason for you in 1980, uh, including the World Series against the Phillies. You became the first player in Major League Baseball history with two multi-homer games in the same World Series. Tell us about that experience. I didn't even know what was going on until after the series, and somebody somebody told me that I had, had made a record uh, in the World Series. Before the series started, uh, the scouting report that I heard – that the Philadelphia Phillies was going to pitch me inside, uh -huh. fastballs inside, okay. try to get in, in on my hand. So as a hitter, anytime you know what's coming, it's a lot easier to hit. You can adjust to that then, yeah. Well, you, you, you don't really have to think about any, any other pitch okay. that your pitcher is going to throw. You can just sit there and be ready to hit the fastball. So my first at bat, I go up and I take the first pitch. And it's a fastball inside. <laughs> so they put it in my mind right then that they are going to try to throw me fastballs. In the first game, I hit two home runs mm -hmm. off of fastballs. And not only was I the, I the, the first player to have multiple home games, but I was the first player and still the only player to hit home runs on my uh, birthday. Uh huh. Uh huh. Pretty, pretty incredible. It is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, that was October 14th, 1980, on your 26th birthday. Uh, the Phillies won game one of the World Series 7-6 in Philadelphia. 
you batted cleanup. Uh, tell us a little more about those two homers you hit off of Bob Walk for the Phillies. Well, I, I was more disappointed than anything that they were able, able to come back in and, and beat us. Uh-huh. We had our uh, best starter on the mound, Leonard. And I think he we was leading like 4-0 going into the sixth inning. And they came back and uh, and beat us. Mm-hmm. Uh, once again, you know, I, I was just going out and doing what I had done the whole season. Mm-hmm. You know, home runs was a part of my uh, ability as a baseball player. I was able to hit the ball out of the ballpark. And... I got f- fastballs in Philadelphia that I could handle, and Memorial, I think is the name of the place. Uh, I'm not sure, but that ballpark that the Phillies played in was a great ballpark. The veteran Stadium? V- veteran Stadium, mm-hmm. yeah. exactly. Uh, I don't think those two home runs I hit in Philly would have been home runs here in okay. in Kansas City. Uh-huh. Now, the two other home runs that I hit in game four, I, I crushed those balls. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, October 18th, 1980. Four days later, the Royals won game four, the World Series 5-3 to three at Royal Stadium. And you hit those two home runs off of Dickie Knowles and uh, Larry Christensen. Yeah. In a, in a bigger stadium, Royal Stadium. Exactly. Yeah. But the third game that we played here, I was the one that drove in the, the winning run for the team. Uh-huh. And then the fourth game, I hit those uh, two home runs, and we ended up tying up the series 2-2. And the fourth home run wasn't a fastball. It was a curveball. Okay. I guess since I hit those three home runs off the fastballs, and Dickie Noel, he comes in out of, out of the bullpen, and he threw me like four, four curveballs in a, a row. Uh-huh. And any time a pitcher is throwing you like the same pitch, pitch after pitch after pitch, you know, he puts it in your – your mind and your your eyesight, so you you, you kind of allow yourself to uh, to to stay back and uh, adjust to the pitch, because you're not going to hit a curveball the same way you're going to approach to the curve. Hitting a curveball is not the same as a fastball. Mm-hmm. You kind of have to sit back and, and wait on it. Mm-hmm. So after throwing throwing me three, you know that that fourth one, he kind of uh, hung it right over the plate, and and I crushed it. Yeah, you were in a zone that that series, that fall series, really incredible. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, yeah, you had the, the game-winning walk-off hit in Game 3 of the 80 World Series. And you hit 400, four home runs, and eight RBIs in six games. Tell us about your preparation for the World Series. I mean, how do you prepare for that? And all the uh, fan hoopla and all the reporters. And it was really a tremendous, tremendous accomplishment. I don't, I don't think it, I did anything different than any, any of the other players. Okay. You know, the World Series is just a, a carryover from playing in the playoffs and the, the, the regular season. Mm-hmm. You don't go out and do anything different. You prepare to play the game the same way. Uh, we used to draw big crowds here in Kansas City anyway. Mm-hmm. So the crowds of the World Series wasn't no different than the crowds during the, the regular season. I mean, and we had an outstanding team. Really, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, uh, George at third, uh, UL at short, Frank at second. I played first. Porter was the catcher. Wilson, Amos, and Hurl out in the outfield. Yeah. I mean, that was almost like a, a all-star team. But a, a lot of times during a, a short series, the best team don't win. Mm-hmm. It's the team that plays the best. And a lot of times during the course of the season, the same thing happened. You might go in and play uh, a team or a short series, and they might sweep you. Mm-hmm. But once again, over the course of the, the year, your team is better than that team that uh, swept you. But as a Major League Baseball player, you know, any team is capable of, of beating you in any uh, short, short series. Right. Mm-hmm. So during the 1980 World Series, the Philadelphia Phillies, they outplayed us just a uh, a little, a little bit better. Yeah, I think their pitching probably was better than than our pitching because our team hit okay. It's, it's just that we had a, a a couple of leads in those games and the, the bullpen. If we'd had a bullpen like we had last year, yeah. boy, oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we might have swept those guys. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is your host Matt Starr of the Kansas City Sports History Group. We're going to pause for a break, so stay tuned for more Kansas City Sports History. This is your host, Matt Starr, 
Now back to more Kansas City Sports History Podcast. Today our guest is Willie Akins of the Kansas City Royals. Willie, did you have any superstitions you followed while playing baseball? Uh, at first I didn't, but I don't know when it started. I used to take my Bible with me everywhere, and I used to read my Bible. I didn't follow my Bible. You know, I didn't... I talked to talk, but I didn't walk to walk. But I started making a cross at the plate. Mm-hmm. When I would come up to the, the batter's box and before I would step in, in the, the batter's box, I would always make a cross uh-huh. before I stepped in the, the batter's box with my feet. Or oh, your feet? Okay. Yeah. In, in the dirt? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep, and it, that became a habit. And when I came over here to Kansas City, I used to watch uh, Hal McCray and George Brett and those guys hit, Amos Otis. And I used to hear, uh, listen to them talk about hitting. And the they used to stand real deep in the, the batter's box. Right, yeah. If you're recalling the, during, the, the, line and get back yeah, the, box. during the, um, the World Series, uh, the umpire, you know, he uh, uh, asked me to, well, he he told me to, to step out of the the batter's box a, a, a few times because my back feet was out of, a, of the batter's box, and I think Bob Boone, the catcher, showed him that. Oh, okay. So he got the bat and drew the lines of the <laughs> the batter's box on me, uh-huh. and we actually had a a little discussion of, about that. No, I'm serious, but I don't know. It just felt like the deeper you got in the the batter's box, maybe you know, it might take a, a couple of miles off of the fastball, uh-huh. or the deeper you get, if a guy has a, a good breaking ball, one of those breaking balls that kind of come up around the plate, mm-hmm. well then you had a, a better chance of hitting it after it got to the the back part of the batter's box mm-hmm. than when you would see it in the middle part of the, the batter's box because a lot of time the ball will come around the plate which it looks like it's outside and the umpire will call it a strike mm-hmm. but I guess those were uh, a couple of, of things that I, I did you know like I said baseball is a game of habits mm-hmm. used to watch uh, Hargrove play uh, Mike Hargrove for the, the Cleveland Indians he had this little, little habit routine with his gloves and stuff that he would he would go to every time he stepped inside of uh, of the batter box. Uh, Willie, what were your favorite cities and least favorite cities to play in? Well, I used to like Anaheim, California. Mm-hmm. You know, they had Disneyland out, out there. I had a chance to live out there for uh, a year and a half when I was, I played for the Angels. Uh, a lot of Bars in the area, a lot of good-looking girls. And, you know, back then when I was a, a young player, that's what I did, man. You know, I, I played baseball and uh, I chased the women. Mm-hmm. It wasn't the right thing to do, but can't go back and change it now, but mm-hmm. that's what I did. Yep. So uh, Anaheim probably was my favorite city. I used to like to go into the, the Big Apple, New York. Uh-huh. I didn't I didn't ever really go out on the, on the town. Uh go to the bars at the hotel or whatever, but New York was a pretty interesting place to uh, to play at. It was always crowded and the streets. Um, the place I didn't like was Cleveland. Hmm. Cle- Cleveland, uh, Ohio. Uh-huh. They had one of the oldest ballparks probably back then when I played, and it just wasn't much to do there. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, the town was, was boring. But I used to hit there well. I remember that. So I didn't like going out on the town, but I didn't mind going there because uh, I used to hit well. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's great, yeah. Well, you played for the Kansas City Royals from 1980 through 1983. Who was your favorite coach and teammates with the Kansas City Royals? Well, um, I always liked Jim Fry. And when Jim Fry got fired... I was disappointed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't really know the reason why he got fired, but I know he used to have pr- problem with the uh, players. I had a chance to meet Jim Fry in 1974 when I was playing up in Baltimore for Johnny's in that uh, amateur league. Remember I was telling you that Walter Yowes, he, he was a scout for the Orioles. Okay. And 
on my off days, Walter used to take me over to Memorial Stadium, and I used to catch batting practice for the the Baltimore Orioles. And after I would catch batting practice, they would let me step in the, the batter's box and I hit some. But Jim Fry was a part of, of the coaching staff of Earl Weaver okay. back then. So uh, I got a chance to meet Jim before uh, I became a professional baseball player. So when he became manager, I, I was pretty excited about that. Uh, one of my favorite coaches, uh, Jose Martinez. Okay. He's coach uh first base. I heard he passed away uh, a week a week ago. Oh, okay. Two weeks ago, I was totally shocked. Mm-hmm. Didn't know anything about it. Um, but as players wise, uh, I don't know if I had a, a favorite player, but I know Willie Wilson and myself used to hang out mm-hmm. a lot. So Willie was probably the, the guy that I would go to, you know, if I wanted that, some kind of uh, entertainment or what, uh, mm-hmm. go out and have some some drinks, mm-hmm. or what, whatever. Uh, George was the guy that I I got along with. Uh, Hal McCray, he was one of the old, older guys on the team at the time when right. I came over to Kansas City Royals. Amos Otis was one of the, of the older guys also. Uh, I always thought Hal McCray was pretty wise. Mm-hmm. He uh, seemed 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 to make uh, good choices, and he was one of the guys I went to her and talked to her when that thing with the the drugs came out. He gave me advice. Mm-hmm. I didn't follow his advice, and if I would have followed his his advice, I probably would have played here in Kansas City more, mm-hmm. because if I would have stopped doing what I was doing like like he, he told me to do. Well, I, I would have never been a part of that drug sting mm-hmm. that happened here in Kansas City. So I totally regret that. Mm-hmm. And Hal McCray is one of the, one of the players that I've kept in, in contact up until uh, today. Really? Okay. He was the only player that I wrote to when I was incarcerated uh-huh. that I heard anything from. Really? Okay. Wow. He, he was the only guy. So I guess those guys. Yeah. But. Right. As a whole, I got along with everybody on the, the baseball team. Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't have any problems with anybody. Incredible chemistry in those teams, I guess, to you know, carry them forward in those games. It was. And back then, you know, the, the Kansas City Royals, the players, was a family. Mm-hmm. But the players was not only a family among the players, but the players was a family with the fans here in Kansas City. I've ran into so many people that have told me that, you know, they go to the the baseball games nowadays and they don't know who's playing second base oh, yeah. or, or, or third base or shortstop. And it's like, they say, Willie, when I used to go back in the day when you guys were playing, I could name everybody by name. Uh-huh. So... I believe with what happened last year with the Kansas City Royals going to the World Series that that team have a chance to develop a relationship. I mean, anytime you win, the fans, they come out of the, the woodwork and start to to follow you again and try to, you know, get that relationship. But it would be great if the, the team that we have now can stay together for five, six, seven, seven years like our teams mm-hmm. used to do and go to the playoffs and, you know, just get that winning tradition back here in, in Kansas City because Kansas City is a, is a baseball town. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, what Royals game are you most proud of your contributions to the team? Game? Uh-huh. Well, I don't know if it's one game, mm-hmm. but I would probably say the, the 1980 World Series. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a series that – Nobody has really done except in 2009 when Chase Utley for the Phillies. He, you know, he he tied my record, but before he tied my record, nobody had had ever done anything like what I did in the 1980 World Series. And basically, my whole baseball career is built upon the 1980 World Series. Mm-hmm. I mean, when somebody talk about Willie Akers. Right. That's what they talk about. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. They mentioned the 1980 World Series. Mm-hmm. And most players playing in the major leagues or that play in the major leagues, they don't go to the World Series. Right. 
So I was was one of the, the blessed ones to have played in the World Series, and I'm truly blessed to have a, a record in the World Series. So uh, any favorite memories of being on the 80 uh, American League champion Royals and playing the World Series? Any other favorite memories you have? I just guess when we swept the, the Yankees, uh -huh. the team as a whole was – was so happy, joyful, that uh, I'm just glad that I was the piece that put, I think I was the piece that put the puzzle to, together for the Kansas City Royals. Mm -hmm. And I'm not bragging about this, mm -hmm. but my first year that I came over here, we were able to overcome the, the New York Yankees and go to the World Series. So that was like a bad uh, stigma that had been associated with the Kansas City Royals in the 70s. Right, right. And then finally, after I got here in the, in the 80s, we were able to put the, the Yankees away and go to the World Series. It's almost like winning the World Series when we beat the Yankees in that, that series, it seemed like, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, in your career, did you play any other positions besides first base or DH? In the big leagues, I didn't. Okay. Before I signed in college and high school, I was a catcher. Oh, really? Okay. I was. Yeah. But the scout that signed me, he told me that I was going to play in the big leagues as a first baseman. Okay. So the first time I played first base was up in that, that amateur league, Baltimore. Mm -hmm. But I was a catcher in college. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Uh, was there any significance to the number 24 you wore in your uniform with the Kansas City Royals? Willie Mays. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. Willie Mays was my favorite player as a kid. Uh-huh. Uh, I used to watch him, you know, the Giants, Willie McCovey, yeah. Willie Mays, those guys. And I chose number 24 be because of him. Okay. I wasn't named after Willie Mays. A lot of people think I was was named after him. I was named after my Uncle Willie. Okay. I think the Mays thing came in there, off a doctor in our neighborhood, his last name was Mays. Oh, really? Okay. Uh... It just so happened, you know, I, I grew up in and I became a, a baseball player. So when did you get the nickname Willie Mays? I mean, who gave it to you? or when did, I don't know how I got have, it. Yeah, started it's, young? Yeah, it's on my birth certificate. Okay, okay. Wow. All that's on there. Yeah. But my mom wasn't a sports fan. Uh -huh. Okay. My mom, I grew up on a stepfather who was an alcoholic. My mom was a street lady. They never came to any PTA meetings when I was a kid. They never came to any sporting events when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't have been sports fans to even think about naming me Willie Mays after a, a favorite baseball player. Mm -hmm. The only time my mom ever saw me play was in the 1980 World Series when we had those three games here in Kansas City. Right. I flew her up here. For those three games. And that was the first time my mom had ever seen me play any sports at all. Wow. Uh -huh. And you know, I know my mom sat there and watched those games mm -hmm. and didn't know anything about what was going on. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. She didn't. So the name to me outside of Willie is a, a mystery. Uh-huh, yeah. Did you have any other sports nicknames while, while playing professional baseball? I have a, a nickname. It's, it's Mick. Okay. M-I-C-K. Okay. Uh, I grew up in a little small community in uh, Seneca. It's called Bruce Hill. And my mom, family, I've never met my, my dad before. Biological dad. Mm -hmm. Guess he was just passing passing through uh, Seneca one time and had a re relationship with my mom. And he was gone. There's a man out there, if he's still uh, alive, that had a, a son that was a, a professional baseball player and didn't know anything about it, okay. which is, is pretty sad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I got the name uh, Mick, M-I-C-K from Mickler. Okay. My mom's maiden name was Mickler, okay. M-I-C-K-L-E-R. And she had 14 uh, brothers and sisters. And... The Mickler family in Seneca was was pretty big. So when I was growing up, 
I wasn't really known as Willie Akins. I was known as Willie Mipler. <clears throat> okay. Because of the, the association with the, the Mipler family. And it was so many of them. So my uncle that I was named after, Willie, they used to call him Big Mick. Okay. And he just lived right down the road from where we lived at. So all my friends and everybody in the little neighborhood of Bruce Hill, they started calling me L Little Mick. And that's how the, the name, it came along. And even up until I became a, a professional baseball player, the players, they used to call me Mick. Well, uh, what was your biggest home run you ever hit with the Kansas City Royals in the regular season? And we know about the <coughs> postseason, but is there any other ones you had, do you remember? I think the most memorable <coughs> home runs were when I played for the Angels. <coughs> I think I tied a record. I hit back-to-back -back, uh, a grand grand slams. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I think it was a – I hit a grand slam one day, and then I came back the next day uh -huh. and hit a grand slam. And then the next day, I had a chance to break the record. And I hit a, a fly ball that was caught on the, the warning track. I'll never forget that. It was, it was against the, the Blue Jays. Okay. Wow. wow. But I was in a, a pretty good streak. Yeah. It was, but probably that. You know, outside of, of the home runs in the, the World Series, uh, home runs was a, was a part of my, um, my job as a, as a baseball player. Mm -hmm. So I don't have any great – Remembers about hitting home runs because it, it was something that I consistently did. Uh -huh. I mean, if it was something that I did every, I would hit one every 100 at bats, well, maybe I would have more of a memory of the ones that I hit. Well, Willie, tell us a little <laughs> bit about your book, Safe at Home. Can you give a summary about that? Yeah, um, I was gone for a long period of time. My last year in the big league was 1985, then I went to Mexico mm -hmm. for six years, and then I retired in 91 and ended up going to prison in 94, and I didn't get out until uh, 2008. So I was just gone for a long period of time out of the public eye. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I wanted to, to do this book was just give the people a, a glance of what happened to Willie Akins doing those... Uh, those years. Um, after being in prison, I used to hear it a lot. Willie, you need to tell your story. And you know, since I've, the book has come out, it's been an inspiration to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been able to do speaking engagements. And if my book or my story is able to make somebody smile mm -hmm. or to give somebody hope or to inspire anybody, well, then the purpose of the book has already been done. Uh, it's pretty amazing how I run into so many people that have had the same problems that I've had and have overcome those problems or that are having those same problems today. I mean, those problems, having friends that are incarcerated, having family members that are incarcerated, having family members that are on drugs and alcohol, having broken relationships, just like me. Um, a lot of things that happened in my life have been restored because I was a, a deadbeat dad, just like my dad was a, a deadbeat dad. My father abandoned me, and I abandoned my two oldest daughters when I went to prison. I went in, they were five and six, and I came out, they were 19 and 20. So just to have the book and let them read about how right. relationships can be restored. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of families out there today that have a broken relationship with their kids. Mm -hmm. um, having over 20 years of being clean and sober and sharing that story. And people reading my book and see how I was able to overcome that. Uh, I run into people a lot that seek advice from me. What can I do okay. for my kids? Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I just 
I had a, a book signing last night, and, and this lady was talking to me about her 18-year-old son that's on drugs. Mm-hmm. So I'm able to see what my, my book and my testimony is doing to other people's lives. You know, I look at myself as, as a servant now. And at one point in time in my life, it was all about me. Willie Aikens, the professional baseball player. Mm -hmm. And I was number one. I was selfish. Thought I was was looking out for for myself. But the part of my life now is more about trying to help other people. And before the the book came out, this was the thought that Gregory Jordan, my Mm co-writer, And Gregory did an outstanding job with the book. He did most of the book. I just supplied him with the the information. Mm -hmm. And hopefully in the future, the book will become a a movie. Oh, really? Okay. Wow. That's the plan. Yeah, it'd be great. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. it would be. And you know, there's always the the financial part of it. Right. It's um, a business for me now. Mm -hmm. You know, I get out and I... I sell sell a book, mm-hmm. and I've been able to make some some money off the book, which is a, a blessing. But all those things I just talked about, you know, is it's worked. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah, thanks for sharing your story. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Well, uh, I understand your 1980 Royals American League Championship ring was several years ago. Can you tell us about the story about how you got your ring back? Man, you don't know how many times I've I've told this story. And it's pretty incredible. And I guess that that's why people want to hear about the ring. Uh, We played in the World Series in 1980, and we got a a loser's ring, the one that don't have the the diamond in it. But anyway, I went back to South Carolina to visit my mom, and when I came back, somebody had broken to my apartment here in Kansas City and stole my ring. Mm -hmm. And I basically forgot about the ring over the course of the years. I never looked for it. Um, Ran into uh, maybe, I don't know, before I went to prison, I ran into somebody that was telling me they had seen the ring. This is probably maybe 10 years down the line. And November 2nd, I made the Chief game, promoting my book, and I just run up on this group of about four guys. And one guy in the group started talking about my World Series ring. And they said, Willie, have you seen your, your ring lately? Huh. And I said, no, it was stolen in 1981. He said, well, I saw it a couple of years ago. I was at this party. Really? And some guy with a, a whole lot of money, he had your ring. I said, well, where is he at now? He said, I have no idea. So I didn't think anything else about it. Yeah. And that same day, that evening at 6 o'clock, I had a speaking engagement at Gaslin United Methodist Church up next to Gladstone. So I drive up there. Pastor Lori Murphy meets me at the door and invites me in and takes me over to my table where I'm sitting at signing and selling books. And she presented me with this business card. And I'm like, well, what's this? She said, Willie, right before you got here earlier in the day, I was out in the neighborhood passing out flyers to let people know that you was gonna be speaking at my church tonight. And she said, I walked in the store right across the street from the church and it was a pawn shop, American pawn shop. And I gave the owner a flyer and he looked at the picture and he asked me, is that the same Willie Aikens who used to play for the Royals in the 1980s? And she said, yes, it's the same guy. He's gonna be speaking at my church tonight. Why don't you come in and hear his testimony? And the guy's like, well, we just finished talking about that guy right before you walked in the door. Give Willie my business card and tell Willie to come see me. I got his World Series ring. Now I'm sitting at the table and the pastor is telling me the story. And I'm like, this can't be happening, pastor. I told her, I said, I just had a conversation five hours earlier at the chief game about my World Series ring. Now, because I'm being faithful and sharing my, my testimony at this church, I go to the church, and the pastor has already been led across the street to this pawn shop where my ring is at. 
I mean, that's not being lucky, Matt. Yeah, wow. Or it's not a, a coincidence. Yeah, wow. I just can't look at it like that. It's like a higher power yeah, led me to the church and has led this lady across the street where my ring is at. Uh -huh. I was in, in, in total shock. But anyway, the next day I come back to the pawn shop and I go in and I don't tell them who I am. And I ask them if they have any World Series rings. And one of the guys say, I think we have one, and it belongs to Willie Akins. Uh -huh. That's what he said. Wow. And I'm like, well, can I see it? He said, well, my brother is in charge of it, and he don't keep it here at the pawn shop. Huh. Let me go and get my brother, and then you can talk to him. So he go and get his brother, and his brother come back, and he asked me, are you Willie Akins? And I said, yes, I am. He said, Willie, I got your ring, and I've been had it for the past uh, 20 years. Wow. And it's inside my safe at home. I said, you got to be kidding me. How did you get it? He said, well, one day this guy walked in, and I think he was a drug dealer. Because the story that he told me how he got the ring, he said that you pawned your ring for drugs. So I'm telling this guy, well, my ring was stolen in 1981. Mm -hmm. And at the time this guy said I pawned my ring for drugs, I was incarcerated. Now, his story was a good story because I was incarcerated for drugs. So the pawn shop owner believed his story. He said he paid uh, $2,500 for the ring. And he said, Willie, if you want to get it, that's what it's going to cost you. So I was like, well, I don't have $2,500. I'll be in contact with you at a later date. So as I walk out to my car and I get in, I'm thinking about giving this guy a book, an autograph book. Yeah. Just to kind of, uh, right. you know, look at me as, as a nice guy. Right. And when I start negotiating about my ring, he might give me a deal on it. Uh -huh. right. So I sign one of my books and take it back inside and give it to him. That's a true story. So he was a, a little shocked. I left and I added this episode of my life to my testimony when I would speak. I started telling the story about my World Series ring. Uh -huh. And it, Fascinated people. Yeah. So one day I'm talking to my friend Kim. I met Kim at this Kindle. I used to keep my dog Mickey at this Kindle each summer when I would go out to Arizona and coach for the Royals. And this Kindle was very expensive. So the owner of the Kindle, he started talking to me about this lady who owns a farm. Mm -hmm. He said, why don't you talk to Kim? Because Kim has about 10 dogs on her farm. Maybe she can give you a deal and keep your dog. So I finally got a chance to meet Kim. Kim took Mickey in, and this is how I know her. So one day I'm talking to Kim, and I said, Kim, I found my ring. She said, well, where's it at? I said, the guy won $2,500 for it. And she said, well, I'll loan you the money so you can get it, Willie. I said, no, I'll get it in time. Mm -hmm. So two weeks before Christmas, Kim called me up and asked me the name of the church where I spoke at. Now, I didn't put two and two together. The Kim was looking for the church to find the pawn shop. Okay, all right, yeah. So on Christmas Eve, Kim called me up and said, Willie, I got a present for you. It's a present that you're going to like, and it's a present that your family is going to like too. Can you meet me at this restaurant? I said, okay. And I'm like, what can she give me as a present I'm going to like, and my family is going to like too. Uh -huh. So I meet at this restaurant, and I'm trying to be smart. She give me a little uh, paper bag. I'm going to reach my hand inside and guess what the present is. And I feel something hard. And I'm like, what is this, Kim? She said, well, why don't you take it out? So I take it out, and it's a, a little square plastic case, and I open it up, and it's my World Series ring. Oh. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me, Kim. Where did this come from? She said, Willie, my mom died two weeks before, before Christmas. And my mom, on her deathbed, told me to do a good deed for somebody this holiday season. Wow, wow. And she said, when, when my mom told me that, mm -hmm. I thought about you and your World Series ring. Yeah, wow. And she said, Merry Christmas. And I was, I, I, I just became, you know, emotional. Yeah. Because that was the first time in 33 years that I had seen my ring. Yeah. And the most amazing part about it, Matt, is that I wasn't thinking about my ring, I maybe thought about it maybe two or three times in the past 33 years. I think when Willie Wilson got, finally got his ring back, mm -hmm. 
that was was one of the times when I thought, well, man, I wish I could could get my ring back too. Mm-hmm. You know, of course, the Kansas City Royal was in the the World Series last year, mm-hmm. so the thought of having another ring because I'm a coach right. for the, the Kansas City Royals popped in my head. But outside of that, I wasn't even looking for the ring. Yeah, what an incredible story! Wow. Yeah, that is, yeah, that is really cool. Yeah, wow. it is. Um, who were the toughest pitchers you faced? I can only think of one. And even though I, I faced a, a bunch of them that were hard on me, but the one that sticks out to me is Ron Gidrich. Okay. Uh-huh. The left-hander who played for the the New, New York Yankees. Right, yeah. I just couldn't hit that guy. And then, like I said before, I finally got him in the, the 1980 World Series. Mm-hmm. I hit that two-run single yeah. and beat him. Well, you had an incredible uh, lifetime batting average of 271 in your career. 110 home runs. Uh, which pitchers did you like facing the best? I mean, who would you really hit off of? I hit some of the the best pitchers of all time. Uh, Dave Steve, who, who used to play for the, the Blue Jays. Right. Pretty good pitcher. Uh, Jack Morris, who played for the Tigers. Right. I think the last time I hit him, uh, I saw him, I hit two home runs off of him. He was uh, giving away his, uh, his his pitches though, so I knew uh, okay. I knew what was coming. Yeah. So Willie, tell us about what you're doing these days after your playing days with the Kansas City Royals. You're doing some coaching. Tell us about that. Uh, I've been a um, minor league hitting instructor for the Kansas City Royals for the past uh, four years. Uh, also, I'm a mentor. Some of the things that I've gone through, you know, off the field, uh, that was the reason why the, the Kansas City Royals. I get a chance to talk to young players uh, every spring training during the, the course of the year. They have problems or whatever. Mm-hmm. They come to me. Uh, I was a, a pretty good hitter, so that's the part of baseball that I I know how to do. Uh, I basically coached in the, the rookie leagues. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm almost 60 now, so for me, moving up the ladder and making it to the major leagues is, pretty, is probably not in my uh, my future, but I'm just blessed to have a, a job with an organization like the Kansas City Royals, especially after being in, incarcerated mm-hmm. for 14 years. I mean, I've ran into a, a lot of my old teammates that cannot get back in the, to baseball. Mm-hmm. I mean, they want to work for teams, but they don't. They don't have a, a, a track record. Track record like I have of being in, incarcerated mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for fourteen years, mm-hmm. but here I sit with a with a job with the the Kansas City Royals, mm-hmm. and it's a blessing for me. Right, well, Willie. What's your favorite Kansas City barbecue restaurant in Kansas City? I don't know if I have one or not. Uh-huh. Uh, I like to I like to try out different uh, barbecue. Uh-huh. Gates and Son. Uh-huh. I like. Uh, <clears throat> I've been on down to LC's. Uh, this uh, one over in Kansas, I can't really th- think of, of the name of it right now. I think it's Joe's something. Oklahoma Joe's or Joe's Oklahoma City, Oklahoma yeah. Joe's. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. I like that, that was, too. <laughs> yep, that was. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, that, that's probably number one, one, one on the list right now. Okay. All yeah. Right. So. Uh, Willie, is there any other uh, Kansas City sports history comments uh, that you'd like to mention before we wrap up the session? Well, uh, when I was here in Kansas City, uh, I didn't get a chance to meet Buck O'Neill. Okay. And I guess during the period of time when Buck O'Neill, uh, I don't want to say became famous, but when 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 he when he he got more recognition here in Kansas City when the Negro Museum was implemented and everything, and they started recognizing him at, at the baseball games. Right. I was in that drug scene, and part of those 14 years I was incarcerated mm-hmm. was during that period of time. And I've heard so many great things about Buck O'Neill, and I never got a chance to to meet this guy. Okay. And I just wish that, you know, he, he's a big part of the, the sports history here in Kansas right, City. Right, right. And I just wish I would have gotten a chance to, to meet this guy. And, you know, just sit around and, and talk to him because I've, I've heard so many great uh, stories 
about him. But that's that's one of the things of the the sports history in Kansas City that I I missed out on, and I probably missed out on because of some of the the bad choices that I made. Mm-hmm. And also, uh, my f- favorite player of all times, my namesake, yeah. Willie Mays. Uh-huh. I've never had a, a chance to meet this guy. Okay, I'm 69. I think he's about 80, 81. Mm-hmm. So it, it's getting kind of late. Hopefully, I'll, I'll get a chance. To, I'll get a chance to meet him. Man. Be awesome, yeah. Yeah, and, and tell him how how people think I was I was named after him. Uh-huh. Yeah. Which I, I I'll tell him, which is a, a great thing, and I'll, I've always cherished his name and always looked looked up to him. And people have I I believe respected me more because I I have his name. Willie, thanks for your time today with the Kansas City Royals uh, history and the Kansas City Sports History Group. Uh, Well, thanks for tuning in, folks. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's Kansas City Sports History Podcast. That's it for today. This is your host, Matt Starr, signing off. So stay tuned for more Kansas City Sports History interviews and podcasts to come.